So I'd like to um, welcome to the front our next, our next speaker. Adrian Johnson holds a BFA in art history and is currently completing an MA in art history at Concordia University. Ms. Johnson is the 2014-15 recipient of the Renata Hornstein Graduate Fellowship in Art History. Ms. Johnson's current research is focused on African-Canadian landscape painting from the late 19th to 20th century as it relates to the exploration of presence, misrepresentation, and the formation of individual and group identity. Um, in addition to contributing to the Canadian Women's Art, his, excuse me, Art Historical Initiative, Ms. Johnson is co-founder of the Ethnocultural Art Histories Research a student-driven research community based um, in Concordia's art history department launched in 2011 with Dr. Alice Ming Wai Jim and Sally Lee um, that facilitates opportunities for exchange and creation uh, in the examination of and engagement with issues of ethnic and cultural representation uh, within the visual arts in Canada. And her talk today is African Canadian Women in Canadian Art that question mark in it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been asked that so many times with my research, so. <laughs> no, I, just, I had to have the inflection to have the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please so uh, join me in welcoming Adrian here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a quick note, um, throughout my presentation, I will be using the terms African Canadian and black interchangeably. Um, I mean it from a very inclusive sense and I do use those terms with respect to the several migrations of persons of African descent over the centuries into Canada. So this presentation, like my, MA, my current MA thesis research, emerged from my inability to reconcile the rich cultural and diverse art history of the African continent produced by people of African descent over several millennia with the absence of African Canadian art in both the teaching and display of Canadian art from 1967 and earlier. Where over the last 40 years, our field has undergone significant changes uh, methodologically and theor theoretically towards improving the representation of indigenous ethnocultural and women's representation. Despite a history spanning over 400 years, early Canadian art is acutely and systematically absent. Feminist scholarship and women's art in Canada offers no exception to this general pattern, um, as embodied in and since the 1975 publication of the Agnes Etherington Art Center's exhibition catalog from Women's Eyes, Women's Painters in Canada. The absence of African Canadians in the teaching and display of early Canadian art history perpetuates several constructed several types. For instance, that the African Canadians were not in Canada prior to 1967, that they were not creative, intellectual or artistic authors, essentially non-factors in Canadian cultural production. This recalls how the Eurocentric colonizing hegemony not only hoarded culture, but uh, employed the associations between Western high art and civilization, specifically one's ability to create fine art in order to rationalize the enslavement and dehumanization and brutalization of African people. As scholar Andrea Fotona comments, one of the prevailing justifications, pardon me, quote, for enslaving Africans was that Africans lacked the capacity to be human because, among other qualities, they lacked the capacity to make art. Art came to stand as one of the higher intelligences of the raciology of the colonial globe and it became a means to rob black peoples of their humanity. However, as I have the privilege to demonstrate today, absence does not equate to inactivity. My discussion will focus on the art by African Canadian women, specifically Edith Hester MacDonald Brown, sorry, specifically Edith Hester MacDonald Brown, Edith Drummond Clayton from East Preston, Halifax, and Artist Lane from Buxton, Ontario. I propose that the art of these and other African Canadian women 
can be read not only as offering poignant insights into Canada's colonial past, but also as cultural mappings of black Canadian women's geographies, psychic and physical geographies that reflect the intersectionality of race, place, gender, and art making in Canada. While work continues in constructing a comprehensive picture of McDonald's life, my interviews beginning in the summer of 2012 at the home of Miss Geraldine Parker, the artist's uh, only surviving granddaughter who lived periodically with McDonald during her youth, <clears throat> um, sheds light on uh, her origins. For instance, McDonald was a descendant of John Brown, a black refugee who was one of the first eight families of Halifax's Campbell Road settlement, which was established between 1835 and 1840. Referred to popularly as Africville from around 1850, McDonald's childhood home, featured here, um, presents a remarkable testament to the vitality of this raised community. Um, specifically as it stands, as a refreshing challenge to the more widely circulated images, accessible on Google, um, that show the image, the show Africville as its popularized negative image as a slum. In 1958, the city of Halifax designated Africville as a slum, and the deteriorating situation was hastened by a systematic culture of anti-black racism that denied these tax-paying citizens the basic services and infrastructure to which they were entitled, including water, sewage, paved roads, police, ambulance, and fire services. Today, where homes once stood, there is now a very lush dog park. Edith McDonald was one of four children of Jessica Brown and Thomas George McDonald. Jessica ran a general store and Thomas worked as a porter with the Canadian National Railway. The course of my research suggests that McDonald's five known paintings dated from 1898 to 1911 are currently the earliest examples of paintings produced by an African Canadian woman. Each executed in oil with highly finished near invisible brush strokes. The paintings are currently in the care of the artist's grandmother, Mrs. Parker, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Until uh, February 2013, the lower painting at the right, entitled Sweet Peas, was the only work of the artist to have been exhibited. In considering the possible training of the artist, Mrs. Parker asserts that MacDonald had studied art in Montreal. If we consider that McDonald's father's employment as a porter, possibly on the Scotian that ran from Halifax to Montreal, there is reason to support this possibility. Whether intentionally or by omission, analyses of, uh, sorry, analyses of art produced by Canadian women at the turn of the 20th century and earlier often neglect the consideration of the African-Canadian woman artist as a possibility. This condition has the effect of reproducing the very elements of colorblindness that have plagued feminism's relationships with non-white women since the movement's beginnings in the 19th century. Feminist art context in mind, my initial departure in thinking through um, McDonald's paintings was to consider the arts of accomplishment, which broadly speaking is a social performance of middle class and white elite families from the mid 17th to the early 19th centuries, where in, that centered around, sorry, the abilities of young women of marrying age to, de to demonstrate their mastery of culture. However, with the dynamic social and cultural and industrial and racial changes occurring during the period that McDonald's paintings were produced, I would like to suggest that like middle class uh, middle class and upper class African Americans in major cities like New York, Boston, and Chicago, who felt a responsibility because of their position to uplift the race, that we can, per, we can read McDonald's uh, participation in the fine arts as a way to demonstrate the respectability of herself, 
her family, and African Nova Scotians as a means to counter prevailing negative stereotypes. For, for instance, in the 1992 article, Race, Respectabil Race and Respectability in Victorian Halifax, Judith Fingard argues convincingly that 19th century African Nova Scotians held strongly to this notion of respectability as a path to integrated participation in Canadian society. MacDonald married William H. Brown in 1914, and these three linoleum-cut prints that are currently on display at the Africville Muse Museum are evidence of the continuity of art making in MacDonald's family. Having been made by their daughter, Ruth Brown Johnson, who was a passionate community activist, teacher, advocate, and artist. She received an honorary doctorate in human of human letters in 1991 from Mount St. Vincent University. Now, while I was prepared for some of the challenges I encountered searching for examples of African Canadian painting, I was not quite prepared for the virtual absence in scholarship and display of African Canadian craft, particularly in the feminist context. However, a noteworthy exception is the is Jordan, sorry, Jolene Gordon, whose scholarly work on black Nova Scotian basket weaving culture has been absolutely um, enriching. Um, Gordon's work, including her text, uh, 1977 text, Edith Clayton's Market Basket, a heritage of splintwood basketry from Nova Scotia, and her most recent text uh, from 2013, Baskets, black, Baskets of Black Nova Scotians, provides deep insight into the culture and perspective of African Canadian life, cultural migration, and art production that merit strong um, further interrogation in Canadian academic and display practice. The traditions of decorative arts, design, uh, basketry, weaving, metalwork, ceramics, pottery, quilting, word carving, extend back to Africa long before transatlantic slavery. During transatlantic slavery, African skills in these areas were highly sought and were, dis were equally dispersed throughout North America. While Canada's Atlantic provinces have a long tradition of basketry, it does remain difficult to ascribe specific techniques to a single origin as baskets and their styles and techniques traveled as much, if not more, um, frequently than people and were hence open to um, open other influences. Clayton, a descendant of the black refugees of 1812, was born in Cherrybrook, Nova Scotia in 1920. A long-standing resident of East Preston, Halifax, Clayton was a professional basket weaver whose craft was passed down from mother to daughter over six generations. This detail highlights the importance of oral tradition as, an integral, as integral to knowledge share as a means of survival within African diaspora communities. Clayton made her first basket at eight years old and grew up knowing that basket weaving was not merely a social pastime. It was a self-reliant year-round means for earning much needed income in a social environment that offered blacks marginal entrepreneurial and employment opportunities. Researching African Canadian history reveals that basket making was common practice among African Canadians in Nova Scotia. Each week, Clayton and her mother, Irene Drummond, would go to Halifax uh, City Market where they would sell their, their wares. And it was there that Edith's mother sold uh, her first basket for 25 cents. In terms of decoration, when using dyes, Clayton was known to make dyes herself with natural materials, or she obtained natural dyes from Mi'kmaq women. Of note is that Clayton's interaction with Mi'kmaq women and Halifax's market days as a site are key locations of intercultural exchange between African Canadian and Indigenous basket weavers. And also should merit further investigation. 
1974, African American scholar Alice Walker asked, quote, what did it mean for a black woman to be an artist in our grandmother's time? Continuing, she asks, she states, quote, it's a question with an answer cruel enough to stop the blood. All the same, it is a question that merits attention. Uh, so, as to uh, so as to counter anti-black violence and silence and the invisibility acute to black women's histories. Clayton's basketry can be found in collections around the world. The works provide another glimpse into the meaning of what it meant to live as a black woman artist in that period of Canadian history. Through Clayton, a rich example of, of continuity, collaboration, entrepreneurship, and the tenacity of African Scotian women can be found. The tradition continues of basket weaving through her daughter, Clara Clayton Gow, who is in her own right an internationally rec recognized expert, craftsperson, teacher, and historian. The final artist of my uh, presentation is internationally renowned sculptor, Artis Lane, a descendant of fugitive slaves born in Nor uh, sorry, North Buxton, Ontario. Lane's work is seldom featured in Canadian art forms. It is more likely, perhaps, that Canadians may be more acquainted with her great aunt, Mary Ann Shad Carey, the erudite abolitionist teacher, and notably the first black woman to publish the news a newspaper titled The Provincial Freeman in North America. In conversation with the artist, Lane recounts her discovery of of art as a child on her grandparents' farm, where she would fashion figures from mud. But it was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where her father left, her father was able to find work during the Depression, where Lane was first introduced to art classes. Returning to Canada at age six, by high school, Lane was making portraits of her classmates, and upon graduation, was awarded the scholarship, a scholarship, sorry, to the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. Three years later, having been awarded another scholarship to study at Cranbrook Art Academy, uh, sorry, yep. Lane moved across the river to Detroit, Michigan. By the 1960s, the artist was regularly commissioned to paint portraits, paint and sculpt portraits of politicians, celebrities, and dignitaries. Spanning a career of over 50 years, Lane's central themes and inspiration include civil justice, spirituality, and metaphysics. Based in Los Angeles, California since 1980, where her interest in spirituality and metaphysics emerged, Lane's work has been described as having a healing quality. As a very well-traveled woman, in response to my question regarding her experiences in America and abroad as an artist, she sighed replying, it's so stupid. Pigmentation, the color of one's skin, can make, a, make that difference in how one sees another. Huh. End quote. <laughs> um, my choice of presenting artists is that in a certain way, she recalls for me um, one of the quirky aspects of Canadian nationalism in the sense that perhaps she fell through the cracks of most textbooks and museum collections because she had spent so long in the United States of America. But despite being an artist uh, based in America, it's worth noting that she is never, she, ne she never holds back from announcing her Canadian roots in American interviews. The art of Clayton, of Macdonald Clayton and Lane are but glimpses into Canadian life and art production. Their work and their stories attest to a Canadian intellectual authorship and narrative long suppressed by omission. 
Overwhelmingly, our exposure to art and culture from people of African descent is limited to blockbuster museum exhibitions of Egypt and Sub-Saharan Africa, or just during Black History Month programming. These temporal and geographic speci uh, specificity of these exhibitions and presentations has the unfortunate effect of also reinforcing that people from people from Af of African defend, descent are past afar or other from the Canadian context. In their edited 2007 text, Black Geographies in the Politics in P Place, which focuses on black positionality and the intersectionality of race, place, and belonging, Catherine McKittrick and Clyde Woods suggest that recognizing black geographies, quote, provide a way in which we can start thinking about how the lives of subaltern subjects are shaped by and are shaping the imaginative three-dimensional social and political contours of human geographies, end quote. In keeping the artistic and cultural geographies of African Canadians alive is a rich and invaluable network of community-driven African Canadian museums, um, including the Black Loyalist Heritage Center of Birchtown, the Africa, Africville Museum in Halifax, the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, um, and in Ontario, the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum, um, in Chatham-Kent, and we also have the North American Black Historical Museum in Amherstburg, in southern Ontario, key sites of black um, arrival. These sites present tremendous untapped opportunities for scholarship, scholarly research, and I would, I would suggest that if mainstream um, museums and other cultural arts institutions were to create more connectivity with these spaces, a lot of these absences could become smaller. There is much to be gained in broadening and deepening the understanding of our multicultural history beyond limited frames of Black History Month or just reveling in the brand of Canada as a multicultural country. If we are to truly break the cycles of the past, it is imperative to include black positionality in the teaching and display of Canadian art history, and particularly from at the turn of the 20th century and earlier. We are assembled here in part to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the exhibition and catalog from Women's Eyes, Women Painters in Canada, curated by Dorothy Farr and Natalie Luckish for the Agnes Etherington Art Centre in 1975. That, an, that an anniversary can also embody reflecting <clears throat> on evolutions made, if any, how does the absence of African-Canadian women artists from this text and text published since speak to feminism inside and outside of the visual arts? Also, how does this normalized absence of African-Canadians in contemporary teaching and displays of Canadian art at the turn of the 20th century and earlier speak to assertions of these disciplines being increasingly decolonized. Our work is only beginning. Thank you.